Hi, this is Congressman Darren LaHood from the 18th District of Illinois, which is also known as Abraham Lincoln's Congressional District. I first want to thank the U.S. Capitol Historical Society for hosting this symposium to commemorate the Lincoln Memorial Centennial and for their work to protect the history of the U.S. Capitol. As I reference, my district is home to Springfield, Illinois, our state capital, and where Lincoln resided and is now buried. From 1847 to 1849, Lincoln served one term in Congress, and nine of the 11 counties he represented currently sit in my congressional district. Central Illinois has a rich tradition of Lincoln history, which I am proud to currently represent. In 2019, Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy of Illinois and I were honored to pass legislation to rename a room in the Capitol after Abraham Lincoln. That's why we joined together once again to introduce legislation to create a commemorative coin in honor of the 100th anniversary of the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. The Lincoln Memorial is one of the most recognized buildings in the world, honoring Lincoln's legacy on our country. Our bill will help ensure the Lincoln Memorial remains a beacon of hope and freedom, not just in the United States, but around the world and for generations to come. I want to again thank the U.S. Capitol Historical Society for hosting this symposium to commemorate the Lincoln Memorial Centennial and look forward to continuing to work with everyone gathered today to preserve our nation's history. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Congressman Rajai Krishnamurthy of the 8th District of Illinois, the land of Lincoln. I want to say a special thank you to the United States Capitol Historical Society for hosting this symposium on the Lincoln Memorial. As you know, the Lincoln Memorial was uh, created 100 years ago. And, you know, it is such a, a beacon of hope and liberty. Uh, and it's a place that many people visit uh, to find peace and to learn more about our greatest president, Abraham Lincoln. As you know, Abraham Lincoln, in his second inaugural address, said he would, quote, achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace with our, ourselves and with all nations. That was his greatest hope. And that is the work that we are trying to do today. And so I'm so honored to join Darren LaHood, my colleague, in authorizing the minting of a commemorative coin celebrating 100 years of the Lincoln Memorial. And I'm looking forward to seeing that legislation get passed and signed into law. Previously, Congressman LaHood and I authored another piece of legislation to rename the room in which Abraham Lincoln did his work in the Capitol as, quote, the Lincoln Room. Now the Lincoln Room is used daily and referred to as such as a place where people come together, discuss matters of the day, compromise, and try to create lasting legislation to continue the work of our greatest president. I hope that similarly our legislation to authorize the minting of this commemorative coin is also successful. I wanna thank you all for everything that you do in celebrating President Lincoln and uh, commemorating the Lincoln Memorial, and I look forward to being with you in person. God bless. Thanks so much, Jane. Thanks, Jim, for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Thanks all of you for being in person. I teach students between the ages of usually 18 and 22, so I do not flatter myself that just because they're in the same room with me, they are listening to me. Um, but I think most of you are, and I really relish uh, that opportunity, especially to talk about Lincoln and the Lincoln Memorial. I brought this picture in today. My, uh, the middle schooler who lives in my house happens to have Lincoln as his middle name. And he is an avid reader of this publication called The Week Junior. And so he came running in yesterday because this week's Week Junior arrived with the Lincoln Memorial on the cover and a two-page spread in the middle. Um, so uh, if part of the mission of the Capitol Historical Society is to do with education, middle schoolers are on board with you too. Um, on February 12th of, 18, of, of 1909, excuse me, Congressman Samuel Walker McCall marked Abraham Lincoln's 100th birthday by introducing House Joint Resolution 254, creating a commission to recommend a design and site for a monument to Abraham Lincoln. That exact same week, a group of black leaders issued a Lincoln birthday call to organize the NAACP. 
Also that winter, Georgia became the latest of the states of the former Confederacy to do an end run around the 15th Amendment and deprive black voters of the right to vote. The simultaneous timing of these three events, I think highlights some tensions and some contradictions within the memory and the legacy of Abraham Lincoln. I think those tensions and contradictions persist, and I think they do so for two main reasons. One is that generations after Lincoln have tried to separate two things that he knew were indivisible, the survival of representative self-government in the United States and true emancipation of the formerly enslaved. That's reason one. Reason two is that later generations have tried to claim permanence, timelessness, and completion of the nation and its ideals. But Lincoln insisted on the incomplete and ongoing work of realizing them. So my big takeaway today is I think we should listen, listen to Lincoln on these two points. First, I'll elaborate on what I mean by this tension, and I'll point to some places where I think we see it. And then I'll take a look at three examples that I think have used the Lincoln Memorial well to follow Lincoln's lead. So, tensions. During the war, President Lincoln, the Civil War, when I say the war, it always means the Civil War. Uh, <laughs> During the war, President Lincoln continually ran into tensions between his duty to save the Union and his desire to rid it of slavery. These tensions frequently complicated what we might call his messaging, but they did not confuse him at all about the centrality of slavery to the conflict. As states refused to accept election results that they didn't like, they clearly explained in ordinances of secession that they were leaving the Union to protect slavery. No slavery issue, no civil war. Everybody in the 1860s knew that, including Abraham Lincoln. So Lincoln knew that unless the root cause of the rebellion was uprooted, the Union would always remain in danger. But he also knew that if the Union broke in two, then the enslaved in states in the Confederacy would stay enslaved. In short, Lincoln understood that the survival of the Union and emancipation depended on each other. Now, after the war, white Southern resentment of emancipation persisted while a white Northern desire for a return to normalcy really overrode the commitment to make emancipation complete. So it became fashionable to separate emancipation and union. It was easier to fabricate a false uniformity call it unity, and use it to suppress more complicated realities of slavery and emancipation. And it was a whole lot easier to claim that the work was all finished. And in some ways, we have to admit, we see these tendencies in the memorial. Not always, don't worry, but in some ways we do. The central figure of Lincoln, as you see here, is seated, which on one hand is completely fitting. It, it suggests his approachability, his man of the people image but it also suggests repose, as if the work is done. I'm not sure if you can see the inscription, so I'll read it to you. In this temple, as in the hearts of the people for whom he saved the Union, the memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever. Not a word about slavery in sight. The word temple and something that looks like the Greek Parthenon suggests a certain timelessness. And the last word is forever, and it's hard to get more permanent than that. But. If you look left at the memorial, and I visited this morning, so I'm sure this is still the case, uh, if you turn to the other side of the central chamber, uh, Lincoln's own words say something quite different. To the left is the Gettysburg Address, which opens with the bold claim that the nation's existence depends upon the proposition that all men are created equal. Union and full emancipation, in other words, are interdependent. And far from complete or finished, they are instead put to the test. Passing that test is unfinished work, which they who fought here have thus far nobly advanced, says the address. Thus far, not once and for all. Lincoln ends with a call, or Lincoln calls, for us to be de here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. Not in the past, not concluded, before us. So let's look at the right-hand chamber. There we have the second inaugural address. 
This one takes the slavery issue head on. All knew it was somehow the cause of the war. In fact, according to Lincoln, to both North and South, this terrible war was the woe due to those by whom the offense, meaning slavery, came. And as for the focus on incompletion, just look to the line about how no end could be expected until all the wealth piled by the bondmen's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk. With such atonement still unmet, the address exhorts listeners to strive on, to finish the work we are in. Now, when this memorial was dedicated in 1922, Robert Russell Moten, the head of, the Tus of Tuskegee, was one of the speakers at the dedication, and he opened his speech with the disembarkation of enslaved captives on Virginia shores in 1619. And he did so to point out that from the beginning, slavery and self-governance were simultaneous threads in the American story. Now, he was speaking in 1922. In that year, the forces that had culminated in rebellion in 1861 were back at work. Since 1909, all Southern state legislatures had choked off black voting. A wave of Confederate monument building, usually at court stout courthouse lawns, had just crested. The Ku Klux Klan was resurgent. Lynchings proliferated. To Moton, Lincoln's legacy on all of this was really clear. Unless we can together, this is Moton, north and south, east and west, black and white, find the way out of these difficulties and square ourselves with the enlightened conscience of all mankind, we must stand convicted not only of inconsistency and hypocrisy, but of the deepest ingratitude, to Lincoln he meant, that could stain the nation's honor. But President Warren Harding, who's the inventor, by the way, of the phrase return to normalcy, censored Moton's remarks. He didn't object to the 1619 reference, but he did object to Moton's suggestion that there was still work to do in the present day. Like the inscription over Lincoln's head, Harding wanted completion. Now, historians, I am very sorry to say, have contributed to this state of affairs by perpetrating a thesis about Lincoln, the reluctant emancipator. This thesis falsely separates wartime goals of union on one hand and emancipation on another, and claims that Lincoln cared only about the former and came reluctantly to the latter. To listen to them is like standing in front of the statue and looking at the inscription over Lincoln's head without turning left or right to see Lincoln's own words on the walls. Luckily, there have also been other Americans who've pushed back against that false erasure, false uniformity, and false sense of completion. There are some historians who have done so too, by the way, but I want to talk about three sort of more regular Americans um, who've used the Lincoln Memorial to do that. In 1939, black singer Marian Anderson was barred from performing at Constitution Hall. A committee chaired by Congresswoman Caroline O'Day and including several members of Congress from both parties sponsored a concert on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Anderson sang a mixture of patriotic songs and spirituals that came straight from the enslaved. She wove together themes of national wholeness, emancipation, and unfinished work. She opened with my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, to thee we sing. Not of thee I sing. She said to thee we sing. She collectively implored the integrated audience to join together in the ongoing work of making the sweet land of liberty real. After that, the memorial became a site for civil rights advocacy, bringing us to example number two, the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. A vast crowd assembled before the memorial, and Martin Luther King invoked the Gettysburg Address. Five score years ago, a great American, in whose symbolic shadow we stand today, signed the Emancipation Proclamation. So like Lincoln, King directly connected emancipation to the survival of the Union. Because the founders had staked the nation's right to exist on the promise, and this is King again, that all men, yes, black men as well as white, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And also like Lincoln, 
King insisted on incompletion. He continued, instead of honoring the sacred obligation, America has given the Negro peop people a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt, and so we've come to cash this check. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to make justice a reality. He insisted on dynamic, ongoing efforts, just like Lincoln. My last example is for Eugene, because it's directly connected to the United States, uh, to the Capitol Historical Society. Fred Schwengel represented Iowa's first congressional district in the House of Representatives for eight terms in the 1950s and 1960s. As chair of the Joint Congressional Committee to plan the centenary of Lincoln's first inaugural address, he raised the idea of turning the empty undercroft, a three-story basement, underneath the museum of the memorial into a Lincoln Museum. But he never got the congressional resolution passed. Then came the March on Washington, the Birmingham bombings, the Selma to Montgomery march, the snarling police dogs, the Voting Rights Act, and several civil rights acts, which Schwengel voted for. Meanwhile, Schwengel also founded the Capitol Historical Society in 1962, and he served as its president until 1993. Over those decades, he never got his museum, but he never gave up on the idea either. And then in 1989, oops, sorry about that. Um, that wasn't supposed to happen, but in 1989, a group of Arizona high school students visited the Lincoln Memorial. They campaigned Congress to create a museum at the Lincoln Memorial to commemorate the living legacy of Lincoln with a civil rights museum in the Undercroft. They joined their idea with Fred Schwengel's. Now, so far, the three-story Undercroft remains empty, but downstairs from the statue, there is a display about how the memorial has been used over the years, including its connection to the civil rights movement. And so here's where I want to conclude. We still need to guard, I think that's a great example of changing over time, of bringing the, um, of people coming together to bring the work forward. But we still need to guard against oversimplifying or asserting some sort of false completion. In our own day, civil rights and voting rights remain vulnerable. I'm not sure Moton's speech would have made it past the first sentence. Um, all of which is to say, that the desire to erase ways in which our story is tangled with slavery persists, and so does our desire for finality, for completion. But I want to end by asking us to take a cue from Lincoln instead. Lincoln had the courage to face up to tensions. He could tolerate a little complexity, and he could handle living honestly in the incomplete and unfinished. Let's be that way too. Saving self-government in Lincoln's day meant defeating slavery. For us, it means defeating the pernicious after effects of slavery. So let's do so with Lincoln's courage, with Lincoln's willingness to handle complexity, and with Lincoln's honesty. As he exhorts us in the Gettysburg Address, let's resolve that our nation shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish, at least not on our watch. Thank you. Susan Mandel. Thank you. Hello. I'm happy to be here to help celebrate the Lincoln Memorial Centennial. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. It's hard to imagine Washington, D.C. without the Lincoln Memorial. It's an American icon. The monument looks like it's always been there, with its timeless design and prominent setting at the end of the National Mall. Yet the idea was originally so controversial, it took Congress more than a decade to approve it. Four separate commissions took up the question, which tells you how divided people were. The debate wasn't tied to partisan politics. Republicans controlled the White House and both houses of Congress nearly the entire time. The main opponent was House Speaker Joe Cannon, who was from Illinois and had met Lincoln as a boy. He vowed he would never let a memorial to his hero be built in that gosh darn swamp, though he used stronger words. He also disliked the remote location on the outskirts of town. Remember, few people own cars, and distances seem further. The area, which was called Potomac Flats, was once a large bay. 
the shoreline came up to about where the Washington Monument stands. But by the 1880s, erosion from farming upstream had caused a bu large buildup of soil in the river and turned the bay into a marshy area. Military engineers began dredging the river so ships could pass through. Potomac Flats was a convenient place to dump the mud. A nearly one mile stretch of, the, of land between the Washington Monument and the Potomac River was eventually created and became Potomac Park. This work was still underway when the Lincoln Memorial was first proposed in 1901 by the Senate Park Commission. The memorial was part of a larger plan to transform the mall into how it looks today. At the time, the mall was full of trees with railroad tracks running across it and a busy train station on its border. The Senate Park Commission plan was based on Pierre L'Enfant's vision of a grand avenue from the Capitol to the Potomac River. Charles McKim, the country's leading architect and a member of the commission, was the man mainly responsible for the new design, including the proposed Lincoln Memorial. Joe Cannon used his position as House Appropriations Committee Chair and then starting in 1903, House Speaker, to block the memorial. But by 1908, one year before the 100th anniversary of Lincoln's birthday, public sentiment in favor of a national memorial to the late president was too strong to be ignored. So Cannon backed a plan to place a memorial to Lincoln near the newly opened Union Station. Visitors to Washington generally came by train, and he wanted the memorial where everyone could see it. The proposed memorial was part of a bill to expand the Capitol grounds by purchasing the six blocks between the Capitol building and Union Station. It would require clearing out an Irish slum nicknamed Swamp Poodle. A monument to Lincoln would fit nicely somewhere in between, Cannon said. That's because a statue of Christopher Columbus was already planned for the most prominent spot in front of this station. Around this time, a magazine article came out with a new idea for memorializing Lincoln. The author was a former congressman who'd been a member of a Lincoln Memorial Commission created in 1902, before Cannon was speaker. The commission's one and only action had been to send this congressman to Europe for ideas. The members were too afraid of Cannon to do anything more. What had impressed the congressman in Europe most was the Appian Way, the ancient Roman road in Italy. What a fitting memorial to Lincoln would be a noble highway, he wrote, a splendid boulevard, boulevard from the White House to Gettysburg. But the, Lincoln memorial, the proposed Lincoln Memorial near Union Station looked like it was a done deal. Cannon said he planned to have the bill ready for President Teddy Roosevelt to sign on the, on the upcoming Lincoln Centennial in February of 1909. Charles McKim was in poor health by now, so Glenn Brown, of the American Institute of Architects took over lobbying for the proposed Lincoln Memorial in Potomac Park. Brown told Roosevelt the proposition to belitt belittle the dignity of Lincoln by making his memorial an ornament and part of a railway station shows the need of expert advice. So just before leaving office, Roosevelt created the Council on Fine Arts. The panel immediately ruled in favor of the Lincoln Memorial in Potomac Park. <coughs> Just as Roosevelt predicted, the backlash in Congress generated favorable press for the council and turned public opinion against putting the Lincoln Memorial near Union Station. Around this time, House Republicans revolted against Cannon, Cannon's dictatorial rule, and he was stripped of much of his power. Congress could finally consider the proposed Lincoln Memorial in Potomac Park. Winning its approval became urgent after Republicans lost the House in the 1910 midterm election. Democratic leaders were from the South and a memorial to Lincoln was not part of their agenda. Congress created a new Lincoln Memorial Commission just before they took over. Cannon was one of the members. Commission, commission members were at odds and requested advice from the Commission on Fine Arts, also recently created by Congress. After reviewing nine possible locations, the expert panel concluded that the one in Potomac Park was the only logical choice. The panel also recommend, recommended naming Henry Bacon the architect. Bacon was a former assistant to Charles McKim, who by now had died. Nonetheless, 
<coughs> Cannon secretly persuaded a majority of his fellow commission members to support putting the memorial in Arlington Cemetery. Lincoln should, Lincoln should be alongside his fallen troops, he said. But at the next meeting, commission member Champ Clark, who was House Speaker, killed the idea, saying, we should not imitate the custom of the ancient Romans by placing a memorial of the conqueror in the territory of the conquered. It turned out Clark was simply repeating what a supporter of the Potomac Park site had said to him. Cannon did get the commission to hold a competition between Henry Bacon and John Russell Pope for memorial designs in Potom Potomac Park and two other locations. Meanwhile, the proposed Lincoln Memorial Road was gaining support. There were no decent roads to Washington, D.C., or to most towns. Rural America's dirt roads had fallen into disrepair since trains had replaced stagecoaches for long-distance travel in the 1800s. Few people owned cars in 1912, but their numbers were rapidly growing, and the bad roads became a political issue. The Lincoln Memorial Commission finally approved Henry Bacon's design in Potomac Park in late 1912. The Senate quickly approved it but it faced an uphill battle in the House. During the debate, highway supporters attacked the design as foreign and not representative of Lincoln. Supporters of Bacon's memorial countered that a really distinctive road would cost $20 million and could only be used by those who could afford a car. The Lincoln Memorial cost $2 million in comparison. Moreover, they said, highway supporters wanted the road to form the nucleus of a national highway system which would cost millions, hundreds of millions more. Support for the road collapsed. Other members had their own proposals, but the monument in Potomac Park was their second choice. In the end, Henry Bacon's design was overwhelmingly approved. Cannon had a change of heart in the aftermath. A few years later, he went on the House floor and admitted he'd been wrong to ever oppose the Lincoln Memorial, which was then under construction on the Mall. Once the monument began to take shape, he could see it belonged there. Thank you. Now, now I'll turn it over to Brian Keefe. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I want to thank uh, Jane Campbell and Jim Ramsey and the United States Capitol Historical Society for inviting me here today. My name again is Brian Keefe, and I'm president of Hildeen, the Lincoln Family Home in Manchester, Vermont. Uh, I also want to thank Jason Emerson, who is an author who has written sort of the definitive biography of Robert Lincoln called Giant in the Shadow. And uh, he helped with this, as did his book help with this. Jim gave me the difficult assignment of describing Robert Lincoln's role in the construction and dedication of the Lincoln Memorial. And while Robert was at the dedication, there frankly is very little direct evidence that he was actually involved in the building of it. But I'm going to make, present a case that his life's work, his personal interests, and his ability, to, uh, his connections in Washington, D.C., because many of you here live and work in Washington, D.C., um, that it is obvious that he was part of it, and I'm going to present a theory at the end uh, in particular how he did that. I also want to backtrack to when Robert Lincoln was growing up. His father, Abraham Lincoln, was a notorious, uh, as a parent, was notorious for letting his kids run free. He had four boys, and those of you who know anything about Abraham Lincoln know that he, in Springfield, he drove his law partners crazy, because his kids were constantly running around the place and tipping over ink bottles and messing up papers and all kinds of things like that. So that is how Robert grew up as the eldest of four boys, three of whom would die during the course of their lifetime. Robert was the only one that survived to adulthood. And so Robert, during the time when Abraham Lincoln was president, Robert was first at Exeter Prep School and then at Harvard University and so he just got back sort of to the Washington orbit in time to be in Washington for his father's assassination. And Robert at that time was just under 25 years old. 
So if you can put yourself in the place of Robert Lincoln, of having grown up that way, being away and coming back, and suddenly your father is gone. That was kind of the preface for this thing. Anyway, back to more <laughs> joyful things. As Susan points out, during this time period, it was a two-decade time period for this uh, construction, and during most of this period, Robert Lincoln was splitting his time between Hildeen and Manchester and his home in Georgetown at 3104 N Street in Georgetown or thereabout. Um, so from 1905 to 1926 when he passed away. Uh, by this time, Robert had been a successful Chicago lawyer. He had been Secretary of War under two presidents. He was Minister to the Court of St. James. He was back to Chicago as a, with more success as a lawyer. He was hired as Special Counsel to George Pullman of the Pullman Rail Company. Then he became President of the Pullman Company and Chair of the Pullman Board. So when he was at Hildy, 1905 to 1922, he was a Pullman President and then Chair. And it was during this time that all of the controversies and uh, legislative stuff went on over this. Robert's lifetime passion was to protect his father's legacy, to mold that legacy. He was kind of a brand manager, and so the, the subsequent speakers, when they talk about public memory, Robert was fundamental in that sense. He guarded his father's papers. Soon after the uh, assassination, Robert gathered all of the papers and letters and private stuff, eight or nine trunk loads of them, and carried them off first to this place and that place and that place. And in the, in, during this time period, he was literally transporting. He had a special train built to transport them from his Georgetown home to his Manchester home and back. Um, and eventually, and, and he gave limited access to these papers. John Hay and John Nicolay, two of Lincoln's secretaries, uh, were given access and, to write the definitive biography of Abraham Lincoln. Robert would dryly call it the standard history of his public and private life. A little bit about Robert's personal characteristics. He refused to trade on his father's legacy. He, he would not seek higher office, even though he was uh, asked to many times. He rarely spoke publicly for fear of diminishing his father's own memory. Uh, he was hardworking. He had a lot of attention to detail. That was his reputation as a lawyer coming in early, working late. He was no slacker, this guy. His hobbies included astronomy. He, has, he built an observatory at Hildeen that's still there. Surveying. He has, we have his surveying tools at Hildeen. And mathematics. He would sometimes pass the time by solving complex mathematical equations. So that was way beyond today's wordle challenges, I think. <laughs> And he was a micromanager. He built homes in, in Chicago and in Manchester. And in Manchester, we have a lot of, in our archives, we have a lot of records of the copious notes and directives and the constant surveying he did on, while the building was going on over the period of 18 months. He would edit transcripts of people who were writing biographies. He would be a critic of photographs and sculptures and portraits and try to promote those that he favored and diminish those he didn't like. In fact, there was one sculpture by George Gray Bernard, a statue that was twice the size of human life, and it depicted Abraham Lincoln at circa 1858 as a big, rough-hewn, ill-fitted clothing, large hand, and Robert hated the statue. This guy, though, was considered one of the best uh, artists of his time, the sculptor, and he was de he was been commissioned by to place it in Paris and in London, and Robert uh, fought a hard battle, for, public battle, one of his few public battles for two years to make that not happen, and it didn't happen, and he pulled out all of his punches, demonstrating his political connections. So. Back to the building of the monument. He was well positioned, well suited to engage in this debate. Uh, did he? So I will observe, I, I'll get to my theory in a second after I do a commercial for Hildeen. Uh, but there, I'll make three observations. Uh, first, Robert was an old school Georgetown influencer. And those of you that work on Capitol Hill know the type. There's lots of them over there and he was in and out. He, had, he went to the parties. Uh, you know, he had the, the uh, gravitas and all of that. Robert was a personal friend of, of President Taft. Taft slept at Hildeen while, while he was president, and he visited twice uh, again with Robert and played golf with him. They were friends. Um, and then uh, there was a man, Representative John D Dwight of New York, who was the majority whip during the time that Susan just described. And I have to think that Robert, the whip, of course, is a person in charge of getting the votes to get this thing pass it, to pass. Uh, 
Robert was so grateful for his work and apparently so up to speed on it that Robert wrote a note to him after this happened and said that in, in, a, in appreciation, and he offered him something tangible as a testimony of my feeling for your work as the whip. And what he gave uh, Representative Dwight was a handwritten manuscript that his father of his father's first speech after, the, after he'd been inaugurated. He gave a brief speech from the White House. He gave it to uh, this Representative Dwight, the whip, and uh, Representative Dwight gave it to a library that in 2009 to help finance some of their improvements, sold it for $3.4 million. So that's how important and personal this thing was in gratitude to the whip for getting this vote. So Robert would have had an interest in the layout of this thing, um, and who knows if he participated, but he, he was granted a visit by the Corps of Engineers during its construction, and he visited the artist. Uh, Daniel Chester French in 1960 while the artist to see the model while, while uh, Daniel Chester French was devising this model. <clears throat> I'm short for time so I'll cut short my commercial for Hill Dean but it, we're up in Manchester, Vermont and uh, it's built by Robert and Mary in 1905 and we have several items that are formerly possessed by President Lincoln, including a personal Bible and one of his three stove, type, stove pipe hats. And we believe this one that Robert may have been wearing it when he visited this dedication in, 19, in 1922. We don't know that, but we like to think that. <laughs> and we are all about Lincoln values forward. Uh, if you visit, you'll see us. We have a second inaugural exhibit. We have a Pullman exhibit. And on the Pullman exhibit, we tell the story of the Pullman Porters, and they're, they're, they're uh, becoming the first black labor union to the Civil Rights uh, March on Washington that we just talked about in 1963. And a gentleman named A. Philip Randolph, who did the organizing for that, for that uh, union, and he was also an organizer for that march in 1963. In fact, I think he was the first one who spoke at that march. A. Philip Randolph, if you look it up, I see some heads nodding, and we, we try to tell that story and engage in that story as a civic thing. So, what I think was Robert's greatest contribution to the Lincoln Memorial, uh, and I have a comment, a quote here from um, Jason, who basically said, he quotes someone uh, saying to Robert in 1925, I will remember your remark that you, quote, did not remember Abraham Lincoln as president of the United States, but as your father. So I think that Robert, when he visited Daniel Chester French while the model was being built, imparted his own personal reflections on Abraham Lincoln, the person, the father, and the man. And I think I was at the Lincoln Memorial last night, and I took a look at that face of President Lincoln, and I have to think that Robert Lincoln had at least some role in influencing the artist in developing that memorial. And he may have had greater roles as well, and maybe in future history we'll know some more details. Thank you very much. And with that, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Roger Aiden. First, let me begin by thanking the U.S. Capitol Historical Society, Jane and Jim, for your generous invitation to be here. Uh, I am honored this is my first time in this building. So even though I have a few years uh, behind me, uh, I am excited to finally make it to uh, the Rayburn Building and pleased to see such a fine turnout today, too. So thank you all for your interest uh, in this really exciting time. The remembrance of Abraham Lincoln's memorial being dedicated 100 years ago. As we commemorate that dedication, I would like to share a few thoughts about the memorial's presence and role in the commemorative landscape of the National Mall. Uh, my thoughts stem from my interest in public memory and the idea of place, so I'd like to begin with a broad overview, a brief broad overview of those two concepts and how I understand them. First, public memory is essentially the distilled history of a group found in a collection of shared stories that group tells about itself while building, maintaining, and revising its self-identity. 
statement. The distillation of history in the service of self-identity generally means that public memory is narrative, positive, selective, and possibly contended at the same time. Places in terms of public memory are the containers in which a group's narratives are held. While places gather and hold those distilled histories, they also keep out other elements of the past that are not selected for formal remembrance. Places like museums, monuments, and memorials are, by virtue of their design, location, and content, shape how we collectively remember and where we collectively remember at the same time. Given these general orientations, I'd like to speak about the Lincoln Memorial's vitality as a place of public memory within the context of the National Mall as a commemorative landscape. I will offer two premises through a series of congressional actions. First, the National Mall functions as the symbolic soul of the nation. And the Lincoln Memorial, in particular, works as the symbolic caretaker of that soul. Let me start with the mall. The National Mall is a space where we collectively craft and maintain and share our national self-identity. The essence of the United States of America, its soul, so to speak, is revealed and made manifest in the places of public memory that comprise the mall. Its first installations, in fact, acknowledged and honored the ideals in which Robert Bella calls the US civil religion, or what I would call our soul as a country. Jefferson's writings about freedom and liberty, Washington's commitment to democratic process, and Lincoln's dedication to unity and justice and equality all intertwine political and religious philosophy, first articulated by Puritan preachers who described the US as a shining city on the hill. The mall's development, guided formally and informally by the Macmillan Plan, uh, written by the Senate Park Commission, as we've heard, in the early 1900s, established the mall as a place to remember, celebrate, and reflect upon the spirit of that civil religion, the soul of the nation. Congress's role in this development is vital. For the various installations that have been established on the mall all required congressional approval, review, and oversight. Thus, the variety of commemorative installations or containers of public memory reflects the ebb and flow of national feelings about the past, manifest in who serves in Congress, and what those elected representatives have deemed worthy of recognition as part of the nation's soul or, as we've heard, where that recognition might take place as well. In this way, the mall has emerged as a space representing the many voices that have shaped the nation's soul. Not just the mall's installations, though, but its green spaces also serve as sites for affirming how we should remember ourselves. As a gathering place, the mall allows us to continuously reaffirm our national soul especially since the 1986 Commemorative Works Act passed by Congress has largely closed off significant additions to the mall. Now considered a substantially completed work of civic art by Congress, the mall's central features will continue to define the soul of the nation. As the western anchor of the mall for the last 100 years, the Lincoln Memorial, by virtue of its location, design, and content, has served as the caretaker of the national soul. My second premise. Now, as an important preface to this premise, the public memory of Lincoln as the caretaker of the national soul is a selective one, as all public memories are. As sociologist Barry Schwartz has pointed out, today's public memory of Lincoln emerged during and as part of the growth of the National Mall. In fact, in the memorial's early planning, Schwartz noted, Lincoln's memory was as the savior of the Union more than the emancipator of black Americans and caretaker of justice and equality. Beginning with the 1939 concert by Marian Anderson, however, the Lincoln Memorial has served a different purpose. Historian Scott Sandage says that beginning with that concert, the memorial became a shrine for justice, liberty, and freedom, the cornerstones of US civil religion. 
I'd like to spend my remaining time talking about the characteristics of the memorial that allow it to serve this role as caretaker of the national soul. First, its location. As the commemorative anchor of the mall, the Lincoln Memorial provides an elevated perspective of the mall, not unlike the shining city on a hill. While the Capitol at the eastern end of the mall provides symbolic closure and a reminder of Congress's role in creating, developing, and maintaining the commemorative landscape, it is not typically considered part of the public memory landscape, uh, despite its function as an informal national museum of sorts with its collection of art and statuary. This elevated location gives those who visit the memorial a transcendent perspective of the nation's soul. When I visited the memorial last night, for example, I saw most photographs being taken from the memorial with the mall as a background rather than of the memorial. My other visits have reaffirmed that. I suspect those of you who have visited frequently will have seen the same thing, right? That perspective makes the difference. Second, design. From this transcendent perspective, the figure of Lincoln surveys that which lies below him and down the mall. His slightly downward gaze, cast from what could be described as a throne, endow him with a secular father persona, right? an omniscient figure keeping tabs on how we're doing as we make choices about what to honor and acknowledge along the mall. Little wonder then that so many groups calling for justice have gathered under Lincoln's gaze and around the reflecting pool, the place where we are encouraged to look at ourselves as a nation. The Marian Anderson concert, Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, Resurrection City, which developed as part of the Poor People's Campaign, protests by rabbis during World War II urging the U.S. government to acknowledge the Holocaust happening in Europe, protests during the Vietnam War, protests from members of the American Indian Movement have all taken place under Lincoln's gaze. And as if to remind us of his presence as a caretaker, the figure of Lincoln is poised for incipient action. His right hand is ready to push his body up. His right foot appears ready to step forward. And his left hand is clenched in a fist, ready to strike a blow for justice. If we all fail to heed the call of the principles in our soul. And then third content. As we've heard on either side of Lincoln, of course, are the engraved words from his second inaugural in the Gettysburg Address. These words emanate from Lincoln's persona and echo down the length of the mall. In particular, noted author Gary Wills, Lincoln's statement in the Gettysburg Address that the nation is dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal has become the authoritative expression of the American spirit. This spirit, moreover, is at the core of the US civil religion, a fact amplified by the second inaugurals, four quotes from the Bible, three calls for prayer, and 14 invocations of God, all reminders of the national soul's mix of politics and religion. So together, the Lincoln Memorial's location, design, and content make it the most powerful symbolic element of the mall's commemorative landscape. It is a place where the nation's soul is contained, remembered, and reinvigorated by the daily pilgrimages of Americans. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce our final presenter, Professor Shema Imbirakira. Wow. I could listen to the uh, panelists speak all afternoon. It's been formative and inspiring. Um, let me begin by first thanking Jim and Jane and the U.S. Capitol Historical Society for inviting me to participate in this panel. Uh, listening to the panelists has been both tremendously educational but also inspiring. Um, in, the in the class that I co-lecture at the Archer Center, we talk about Washington as being like ancient Athens, like ancient Rome. And the work that all of you do and the work that the 
Capital Historical Society does will be the stories that we tell 100 years from now about this remarkable story, and this symposium is part of that creation, so it's really an honor to be here. Um, as I alluded to earlier, I am a co-lecturer at the Archer Center. The Archer Center is a fellowship program that brings 50 or so students from across the UT system each semester. Uh, these are our best and our brightest to uh, do an internship and take classes. The Archer Center was a creation um, of somebody who spent a lot of time in the halls of this building, um, one of the great statesmen from Texas, Bill Archer. And the politics of national memory is the brainchild of Dr. Joel Swordlow, who recognized that the mall, which he defines as being between Arlington National Cemetery and Capitol Hill, is sort of the ideal uh, classroom for interrogating the big questions of society. What is democracy? What is truth? What do we owe each other? And Dr. Swordlow also recognized, and I think he's correct on this, that when you step on the mall, something happens, right? That when you walk up the Capitol steps, something opens up. When you sit in the uh, main room of the Library of Congress or when you stand before Lincoln, there's something, there's this interplay between what we know about these tokens of memory, what's been written about them, but also our direct experience with them. Something about that interplay pushes our students to deeper introspection, to greater curiosity. They start making associations and trying to create meaning, meaning out of those encounters. And so that sort of dynamism is what the politics of national memory is trying to uh, evoke from our students. And a few years ago, uh, Dr. Michelle Chin, who's our academic director at the Archer Center, who's here today with us, had the wonderful idea of starting our class each semester at the Lincoln Memorial at sunrise. And for all the reasons that have been discussed here today, um, it is sort of the ideal site uh, for having this introductory class. Um, there is something, as Dr. Aiden beautifully laid out, sacred and special about this site. And as all of the speakers have noted, you know, Lincoln himself is a container that so many of our thoughts and ideas about America fit into. And so it's sort of this ideal spot for beginning our discussions. And what we notice with our students each semester is that when they think of the Lincoln Memorial, they think of much of what we've discussed. They think of the March on Washington, the iconic I Have a Dream speech. They think of Marian Anderson. And one of the things that we try to point out as we're talking about this history is sort of the inadvertence of so many of these events, right? Um, Dr. Manning mentioned earlier that Marian Anderson was originally supposed to speak at Con Constitution Hall, and because of uh, the ban by the Daughters of the American Revolution, ended up um, at the Lincoln Memorial, thanks to Harold Ikes, who was the Secretary uh, of Interior under FDR. Was supposed to be at the Capitol, at Capitol Hall, Constitution Hall, ends up at the Lincoln Memorial. Same thing with the March on Washington, right? Originally supposed to be at the Capitol, but because of well-publicized fears at the time that the march would end up violent, um, it was decided, and these were beliefs that were held by individuals like John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy, they decided to move the march as far away from the Capitol as possible so as to not uh, make the members of Congress feel like they were under siege. That decision, especially in light of what happened on January 6th, has special resonance. And of course, we go further back, as was mentioned, you know, at the opening ceremony for the memorial, you know, it was a segregated event, right? The, the Robert Moton uh, had his, as, as was noted earlier, had his uh, remarks, particularly those remarks about protecting the rights of African Americans, censored by, you know, former president and then Justice William Taft. And so, for our students, when we when we think about the the Lincoln Memorial, when we think about these tokens of national memory, what we're encouraging is first starting by taking a hard, honest look at the facts, at the things that have happened, but not stopping there, right? Allowing the students to build off of that history, off of those stories, to tell a bigger story, a more inclusive story, right? Through, through some of the traditions we have, like the Sunrise event, we allow the students to insert themselves into the larger story of the Lincoln Memorial, to widen the aperture, to tell the stories of those who often have not been included um, 
and to make themselves part of the legacy on the mall. And for us, we see that as deeply empowering when we think not just of the last 100 years of the Lincoln Memorial, but the next 100 years, the idea that there's this dynamism and fluidity and storytelling and mythology that can empower and include gives us something to shoot for. It gives us something that allows us to hopefully pull this country back from the brink of democratic collapse and move us closer to the ideals um, that were espoused in our constitution and that are represented by so many of our monuments, landmarks, and sites on the National Mall. And I wanna end with uh, sharing something that I shared with our students before the last uh, Sunrise event. Um, I was trying to think of a way of getting the students excited about uh, going to the site, which isn't very hard to do. It's such a powerful and beautiful place. Um, but I wanted to share with them what the memorial site means to me personally as an immigrant to this country. Um, and I think that what I shared hopefully uh, reminds all of us of sort of the way in which we can continually reimagine the Lincoln Memorial in a way that propels us forward, uh, both individually and collectively. So this is what I shared with our students. I arrived in Washington demoralized. I had quit my job at a well-regarded law firm in my home state. I wasn't doing anything that animated me. My health, young marriage, and sense of what was possible for my life bore the cost. A friend recommended that I visit the Lincoln Memorial to quote, clear my mind. The place has a spirit to it, he said. I went to the Lincoln Memorial late at night. I went early in the morning. The memorial, the memorial became a sanctuary. I communed in spirit with slaves and soldiers, presidents and pastors, immigrants and union workers. I breathed in triumph hope, resilience, and pride, and breathed out pain, shame, cruelty, ignorance. Slowly, I began to feel again. I realized that my adopted country, I realized that like my adopted country, I contain multitudes, and my past is prologue. The blank pages before me were bright with possibility. I hold the pen. Thank you. What an extraordinary panel. Thank you, each and every one of you, for your time, your talent. And I want you to have a perspective. Uh, you remember that Mark Twain said something about it's more difficult to be brief than to be long. And the fact that each of them took their expertise and did it in a relatively brief way is a testament to how much they really know and how much they can share. Uh, we are so grateful that you are here with us today. And we want to make sure that if there's anyone who hasn't had a lunch, there are more lunches available. So please do get your lunch. Uh, we want to make sure that's a possibility. Um, and for all those of you who have a, uh, who want to take an in-person walking tour uh, of the Capitol grounds with our guides who have been all trained by Steve Livengood, who is our, our chief tour guide. You can wave your hand if you don't know Steve. Um, what we are going to do is uh, you can just uh, come in and schedule, and we'll put you in with uh, various tours that are going. We have tours going of the wa of walking of the grounds uh, on a regular basis, and it really is delightful to be able to do that. Um, so there, you just have to make sure you're checked into this event, and then you're on our master list, and you can uh, call us up or send us an email to tours at uschs.org and say, my name is Jane Campbell, I was at the event, and I would like to be scheduled for a tour. Uh, and you'll get some information about available times to do that. Um, I think you've heard about our, our sponsors and our, our
partners in this effort. Michelle Chin was introduced. Where is Dr. Chin? Thank you very much for being with us from the Archer Center. Um, you heard from Brian Keefe particularly, um, and I want you to know that when you see it, five minutes of two, uh, Dr. Keith is going to duck out of here. Um, he has to be on a plane, so don't stop him, because he is going to walk out of here uh, in his distinguished manner. And David Kent, uh, is, David, is David here uh, from the Lincoln Group of the District of Columbia has also been a partner of ours, and we're grateful for that. But I also want to take a minute to acknowledge the staff of the United States Capitol Historical Society. You saw at the beginning I couldn't work the technology. Uh, Sam does more than the technology. He does an enormous amount as the Director of Operations and Scholarships. And so we thank you, Sam, for your work. Um, uh, uh, and. Then Yanni is our communications director. Anyone who reads the newsletter, where did Yanni go? Oops. Yanni is a behind the scenes guy, you know, so you'll, you'll see his words and his pictures. Um, and I'm not going to name everybody's name because we'll get ourselves in trouble, but Jasmine, uh, Sharice, Karen, Donis, Lashan, all wave your hands. Uh, we're delighted to have such an enormously uh, great staff. And as we always do, we have to remind you that the Capital Historical Society exists because of the support of our members and friends and your donations. Keep those cards and letters coming. We love your support. Um, and now we turn to our traditional question and answer period. Um, and I have two questions. One is going to be the last question, and one is going to be the first question. And then if any of you have other questions, uh, we want to make sure that you have that opportunity. Before we move to the questions, you've heard everyone uh, talking about Jim Ramsey. And Jim Ramsey is our, part of our volunteer staff. Uh, he serves as our senior advisor. Uh, and this particular project has been his passion project. Uh, he came to us and said, we must do something about Lincoln's 100th anniversary. And so thank you, Jim, for pulling this together. <laughs> and can you believe he's the one that kept all the speakers on time? <laughs> now, that is not easy to do. Um, so let me ask a question. Um, we recently celebrated the bicentennial of Ulysses, Ulysses Grant. Um, and there was a moment in time where President Grant and President Lincoln were on par as most distinguished presidents. And then there was a time where people didn't feel so great about President Grant. Uh, Dr. Manning, you're a historian. You know, what... How is the ebb and flow of how much we feel about our presidents, and what's your thought about that? On Grant in particular, is it the first one? Um, on Grant in particular, the ebb and flow applies. Oh, clever. Thank you. Um, uh, so the ebb and flow on presidents in general is one question. Grant in particular, which I think is the question mm -hmm. you're asking me. Um, Grant in particular, I think that there, um, there are two uh, unique dynamics that apply to Grant in particular. One um, is that from the founding of the nation, there was a very deep-seated principle that is less at the forefront of our brains today, but still was very at the forefront of the brain in the 19th century. And that was what's the proper relation between civil and military authority. And a founding principle, this is one of the things that the... Um, um, the Sons of Liberty and all of those groups were really, really dedicated to was that civil authority has got to be preeminent over military authority. The founders had a really deep suspicion 
of military authority, and it's not hard to understand where that would come from. That suspicion has waned in our day, but it had not yet in Grant's day. Grant rising as a general and then becoming a president, that was a stigma that's hard to understand to us, but that was a stigma in the 19th century, and there were plenty of Americans um, who, who... who, that just troubled. So his stock always had that deep well against it. And then he had the same political enemies as anybody had, but he gained more with the, um, the enforcement of the Ku Klux Klan Act and the Civil Rights Act. So in his immediate day, there was that deep well of suspicion and then things that he did that, um, uh, that gained hostility in his own day. And so it was very, he was an easy guy to make stuff up about. He had struggled with alcohol early in his life, not as, um, not as president, um, but it was easy to drag that up. And then finally, and then I'll be quiet, um, he was a far too trusting individual, and he did, there's no question about this one, he did surround himself by people who did wrong, and he couldn't believe that people would do wrong. And so horrible corruption happened in his um, administration. There's zero question about that. Um, his big sin was not believing that people were capable of it as opposed to indulging in it. However, it's tough to maintain high presidential stock when you're surrounded by that kind of corruption. So so the short answer, just condensed, is deep-seated principle about civil and military authority, things he did as president combined to make him just volatile in terms of memory. Fascinating. Now, this is your time, so if you have questions, please raise your hand. Um, Stand up. So Frederick Douglass is such a fascinating figure who evolves far more than Lincoln does, actually. So a really interesting thing to do is read Frederick Douglass um, over time. So there's no question that Lincoln opposes slavery from the outset and wants the war to end slavery. That's There's no question. That, that, that is a beyond debate. His idea about the power the president had to do it, going back to the civil military authority issue, which we lose sight of, and he didn't, um, he was very afraid of doing things through military action because that's the door to tyranny. Um, and he had to stay elected, or he had, well, he was elected, but he had to keep Congress um, with him, and Congress is up for election every two years. And he's leading a North that mostly, by and large, doesn't love slavery, but is not, by and large, delighted about the idea of sending their own 18-year-old kids off to die for it. Um, And so when I said that uh, um, uh, sometimes his messaging, what we would call his messaging, gets complicated, we have to remember that he is a guy in marble for us, but he's a guy who had to lead a messy country through a messy war in 1862. Um, So his initial plan, he wanted the states to do it. He wanted the states to get rid of slavery on a state level because then nobody later could overturn it. If he did it as president during war, as soon as the war is over, that can go, that thing can get overturned in a jiffy. Um, So uh, if you are Frederick Douglass, you don't have to worry about who gets elected in Illinois in 1862. And Lincoln needed Douglass. I don't mean to say that Lincoln had all the answers and was perfect because he was not at all. Um, He needed somebody like a Douglass to pull him um, in the direction that the war went. But we are wrong if we think he went there reluctantly. What he changed on was what he thought he had the power to do. And to be honest, he didn't 100% change on that. He was not sure he had the power to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, which was why he was so dedicated to hauling the 13th Amendment through um, through Congress. That, I think, that's, that's a topic for a different day, and I don't want to keep hogging time. That one is... Um, 
that's where you see the political and the emancipator really come together, I think. Yes, in the blue. Ryan, do you want to handle that as the uh, uh, family li li liaison? And Not you're, really. You're also allowed to say, I don't know the answer. <laughs> the, the, the question was, just for, for in case you didn't hear, uh, was about the mental health diagnosis of Mary Todd Lincoln and the uh, physical and, and mental health diagnosis of the president and some of those questions, please. Well, I'll, I'll first say that there's probably people on this panel that are more qualified than I am on the medical condition of Mary Lincoln. Uh, and it's, it's a point of debate. Um, I, I really don't feel comfortable commenting. I don't, I don't have enough knowledge myself. Obviously, they, the tragedies that she endured in her life were just tremendous. Um, and I don't, I don't know the answer on the, on the disease either and whether that contributed to the death of the other three boys. I, I mean, Robert, Robert also suffered a tragedy of losing a son uh, when his son was 17 years old, Abraham Lincoln II, they called him Jack, who died <clears throat> while they were in Europe when, when uh, Robert was the ambassador to Great Britain. And it was basically an infection that just they could not stop. It was before a lot of uh, different medicines were available. So the, there's tragedy through that whole family up and down and instability. I really, I, I don't feel comfortable going beyond that. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I don't know that, if others that's do. That's fine. Um, I, let's see. Do we have, um, we're going to do two more questions and then the last question. Um, we'll do the woman in pink and then the gentleman in the front row. Um, yes. Um, this is, my question is for Mr. Vera Rivera. Uh, how did you get those kids up that early? <laughs> <laughs> Donuts. <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Uh, well, you know, we have uh, Dr. Chin here, and, and, and she's got a wonderful relationship with our students that begins well before they ever get to the Archer Center. And frankly, for many of our students, they've never been to Washington, D.C. You know, so much about being here is exciting. And I think that's something that many of us who live here sort of take for granted, right? That standing in front of the Capitol or going to the Lincoln Memorial or Jefferson Memorial, these are inspiring places, they're sacred places. I think the students pick that up fairly quickly and want to be part um, of that experience. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Sir. That's not something I um, looked looked at in particular. I mean, he was elected, I think, in 1912. And um, so things were already, you know, well along the way by the time he got elected. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure if he would have been the president to sign the bill into law. You know, dep um, you know, it might have been. It probably was signed into law like right before he took office, so I'm not sure if he had any role. But you know, in in general, um, you know, there was a solid Democratic South, and so the and the leaders of the party were from the South, and you know, a memorial to Lincoln, you know, just wasn't a top concern for them. In fact, I. I do know that in 1909, on the Lincoln Centennial, there were celebrations throughout the North, but in a lot of communities in the South, including Richmond, 
it was only celebrated in the in the black community. So. So this is the last question, and uh, Brian, we're going to let you go first, so you can answer the question and then go. But this is a question for each of you. You've talked about public memory. You've talked about the Lincoln Memorial. What historical figure does not have a memorial who should have a memorial here in Washington, D.C., and why? It's been a while since I lived in Washington, so I'm not sure who's here or not, but I think, uh, I don't know if Frederick Douglass has a memorial here, but he'd be a good candidate. Does, does he? His home, but that, that's... Anyway, that's my answer. Okay, that's a good answer. Um, all right, go get your plane so that you're not in trouble. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, all right, we're going to go backwards. Dr. Aiden, who, who, who should have a memorial and why? I'm going to dodge your question just a little bit by saying not who but what. I think we need to have a national memorial to slavery or to those who were enslaved is probably a better way to frame that. Until we in the U.S. Capitol, in the soul of the nation, acknowledge what this country did and what its residents did and the legacies of that that we are still dealing with today, I don't think we can come face to face with that issue and the injustice that still permeates our society until we do that. Abraham Lincoln's a very reassuring figure because we can think about him as fulfilling that promise or potential, but the work still needs to be done. And while we can see Lincoln as the person who encourages us to do that, it's still an indirect and insufficient route to remembering slavery in the United States. Great. Susan. Um, I don't, you know, that's not something I've ever contemplated. I do agree with Brian's idea, though. Frederick Douglass would be a good one. Okay. There's, there's not a right or wrong answer. This is not a quiz, right? Uh, uh, all right, Chandra. I give my students this assignment sometimes. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, what I have on my mind, though, is I was uh, uh, is I have two things on my mind. One is I was recently asked to review um, a national monument um, nomination that I didn't think rose to the standard, especially in the absence of something that is not memorialized that I think should be in the national capital region. And that is a memorial to the thousands of enslaved people who escaped slavery during the war, camped with the Union Army, and became the logistical backbone of the Union Army, who were the nurses, who were the laundresses, who were the spies and intelligence gatherers. Um, the closest we have is you can do this one in an afternoon. Um, Alexandria has the Contraband and Freedmen Cemetery, which is a lovely memorial, but Washington, D.C. itself should have a memorial um, to that phenomenon. The second thing I would say is that the Lincoln statue in Lincoln Park, I think it's called Lincoln Park, it's become mm -hmm. controversial, that's not the original design. The original design of that statue looked completely different. It had um, Lincoln's coffin surrounded by four standing figures, one of enslaved person, one of a fugitive slave running away from slavery, one of a worker in a contraband camp, and one of a Union soldier. I would like to see somebody create that design. Mm. Mm. Shema. So, so we also give our students a similar assignment. And what's interesting is almost to a student, um, the, the sentiment is that we should stop honoring individuals. Right, that if you pick any individual and look deep enough, you're going to find something that people are going to be upset about that's going to create controversy. Why not have more monuments to ideas, to charity, community, you know, and so on, right? And I think that's consistent with a lot of what's been shared here, right? That when our students come here, oftentimes when they think of Washington, they think of something small, petty, right? Because of what we've heard about the politics in the city. And when they get here and they, and they experience these monuments, it has a sort of capaciousness, right? It opens them up. It makes them feel bigger. And I think the more that we can do to honor ideas, the, the, the ideas that were part of the founding of this nation, the more we'll pull people towards, I think, our, the better version of ourselves. Well, I want you to know that we have for each of you, um, one of the things that the society does is that we have 
ornaments that commemorate various things. And we have a commemorative ornament for the Lincoln Memorial. And so we will give to each of you who participated as speakers um, uh, the ornament. Uh, Jim is preparing them. Um, and you can open it and show it to the audience because they are available. <laughs> Just so you know, it's always, you know, we, we always have our NPR moment. Um, this is uh, some, one of the ways we support the society um, is with commemorative, uh, commemorative merchandise. And you can uh, get that at our website. Um, so please feel free to join us and share. I'm sure all your friends are just anxious to have this opportunity. Thank you again for being with us, for uh, being here today, for your thoughtful questions that you provide day in and day out. We do have coming up, our next webinar series is part of the series that we started on the Constitution and the fact that it could be amended. Um, and why, you know, what have the amendments meant? We're still on the First Amendment um, <laughs> because there's so much in the First Amendment. But we are going to have the last part of the First Amendment because that has freedom of speech, freedom of the press. Um, and so we're going to be looking at freedom of speech and assembly and the right to petition your government. Uh, that will be a webinar-based uh, activity. We look forward to having you join us. It's on June 23rd um, at 12 o'clock, 12 to 1. Um, it, as always, will be uh, recorded. So if you can't join us at that time, you can watch it later. This will be available. So if you had a great time and you want to share it with a friend of yours in a couple days, it will be available online. Let's give one more round to the panel. Thank you.